So one of the themes that comes out in this podcast is the idea that creativity comes in seasons. And what that means is that your creativity doesn't stay the same throughout your entire life. Your relationship, your goals, and your desire to be creative can change throughout the entire time. But what does that actually look like in a practical sense? Well, uh, today I want to find out. Hello and welcome to Creativity Uncovered. This is my podcast where I uncover how everyday people find inspiration, get inventive and open their imagination. And basically, I want to find out how people find creative solutions and then how they use those solutions at home, work, play and everything in between. And my goal for this podcast is that by the end of it, you'll be armed with a whole suite of tried and tested ways to summon creativity next time you need it. Today, I'm speaking with Naomi Crane, who is a singer, a songwriter, podcast host, and a mentor for the Australian Songwriters Conference. Welcome, Naomi. Hi, Abby. It's great to be here. Yes. So pleased that you could come on and have a chat with me. I'm super keen to pick your brain. So I love an origin story on this podcast. (laughs) And you have so many different connections to music and you've always been connected to music. So I want to start with, tell me what, what drew you to music in the first place and what did your early relationship with music and your career look like? Yeah, great question because... It really is an interesting story when people look back at the things that happened to them as kids and the things they're exposed to and how that forms us as we grow. For me, I grew up in a very average family. I don't have musicians as parents and I don't have, uh, uh, I didn't grow up in a family that was all kind of out in the music scene. I grew up in a household with a mother who was determined her children would learn to play an instrument Uh, I don't think my father would have cared, but she made sure my brother and I learnt the piano from about the age of five or six. And so that was there. But apart from that, my mother listened to some music. (laughs) She liked to play her records as it was then. And that was about the grounding I had. My brother, however, has also become a professional musician. And I don't think that it's an accident. Everyone likes to say, oh, well, you know, great aunt Harriet, she was, she was a great musician. You must have got it from there. But I wonder if the creativity that my brother and I have in di- very different ways, we're very different in our musicianship, was allowed music. That was something that my, at least my mother, understood. Looking back at myself as a child, I was a designer, like a visual designer from the get-go, and that's what I spent so much time doing, uh, crazy amounts of time, fashion designing and uh, like what we would call architecture in a childlike way or town planning or I would draw these things, like creativity as a kid, you're doing all kinds of things. But no one in my family knew what designers were. No one knew what visual design or graphic design was. No no, No one knew anyone who did that. What we had was music, we were learning music and we were a very church-going family, so we had music playing a role of some practical use. (laughs) It wasn't just something you did because you had to. And so both my brother and I went into the music in the church uh, because that was what you did if you could do some music. So the first part of the origin story is I think that was the art, the outlet for creativity that had some use and some tangible output in in life in the family that I came from. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of so basically, your mother could relate to that form of creativity and sort of push you towards music, even though you were doing all these other things yourself. Yes. Why is it do you think she chose music? Well, I mean, I think she enjoyed music. I think she grew up in a family that was very, very poor and no one did any of the arts. There just wasn't money for any of that. And so I think 
it, there's probably something in her head that said, you know, good middle class children learn an instrument. But she also really loved the piano and I think she just, again, it was it was an art form that it was accessible. If we'd wanted to, goodness, I don't know, paint massive oil paintings, like the investment there was would have been huge and where would we put it in our house? And we got a piano. I'm sure someone gave it to us. It was old but it was there and so it was just the cost of lessons. So I think there's a practicalness, there's a tangibleness. We have a life. You can go and play in the church and then you can have an outlet for that music and music is tangible in all our lives. I mean, you just put on the radio and there it is. So yeah, I think there's an accessibility to music that is closer to most people's lives than most other art, work, art forms. Oh, yeah, um, absolutely. In terms of the doing of it, we all have art all around us and people's creativity and the design and the whatever's every, everything that ever existed has been designed by someone, you know. They had to be creative to come up with it. But in terms of our, our processing of what, what can we use this for, music is, I think, the most tangible. Perhaps acting, but then, yeah, I think you can't kind of, sit in the spare room with the <laughs> the acting coach like you can with the piano like i still think it's more accessible to yeah or a guitar. <laughs> anyway that was a bit yeah. rambling <laughs> yeah no I, I was just thinking as you're saying that you know like when you get an instrument you know exactly what's supposed to happen with it you know like you get a right. piano you know you're supposed to tinkle away on the keys and but if you get you know paints there's so many different ways to do it that I can say that's probably like a way that is detracting for for some people because it's not so clear-cut exactly what you do with it so I wonder if that is part of it as well yep and I think uh kind of bouncing on that idea we can see that you know I have my my favorite song and then I can sit down at piano and I might not be able to play but I if I can just tinkle out the melody I'm, I've kind of gotten what I'm after, like, oh, look at that. Um, but to sit down with my favourite, you know, Van Gogh and go, let's recreate even a bit of that, I feel like that's so much harder. <laughs> I can try, but I don't know, I think a basic strumming of a guitar, you get through most pop songs, you know, are fairly simple chords. You can get a version that you recognise as that song, like, yeah, I think getting to something that feels good is is easier with music. I don't know. Maybe some people will argue it hasn't been for them. But. <laughs> they can certainly comment if they have other thoughts on it. But I do think that having that instant sort of reward of you are actually able to make some type of sound would yeah. definitely appeal to some people for sure. Yeah. Mm. So so you were sort of pushed in the music direction even though you were, you know, interested in sort of visual design and all these other elements, did you enjoy doing the music at that stage or was it kind of like your music mother lessons, wanted to do it? Yeah, piano lessons were always a bit of an effort and I think that's because they try and teach children classical pieces that they have no interest in. And I, I, my memories I gave up as soon as I was allowed to, but by that point uh, I was in high school and already playing the guitar my brother a couple of years ahead of me was a was very good but he and I both had very silly practical things that threw us more heavily into music he had an injury he was quite into sport had an injury couldn't play sport for a season so they he got a guitar and then just sat in his room because he couldn't do anything and learnt how to play and it became a career I was playing around because the guitar was then in the guitars were then in the house and I studied music in high school but most people do you play the recorder or the I think they do the ukulele now but I got to the point where I had to choose my HSC subjects and in the way my school had you know you have to choose something from each block it was all sciences except music and I probably wouldn't have done music for the HSC except I didn't want to do any science so I was like well that's my choice. I'm doing music. Two years later, 
I enroll in a music degree after university. So it was sheer for me avoiding science. And my brother, again, was just had nothing else to do because what he would have done, he couldn't. And I mean, I, I, it's funny and perhaps, perhaps it's fate. Perhaps it's just the way things go. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, and perhaps we're both built to, in, in those years where you are kind of deciding what you're going to do for a living, you know, 15, 16, 17, 18, at least what you're going to do at university and after school age is when, you know, pop music becomes really important to you. You start to have tastes, you know, there are different, you know, rock music or you like pop or you like dance music, or, you know, you have your taste in music and I don't know, I feel like kind of that middle teenage years, it becomes important and so it feels like more of a thing <laughs> to choose. Yeah, I want to do that or I want to play that. So, again, I think it's the intersection of life and some natural ability and some, you know, that's just what was normalised in my family as, a, as an expression. Yeah, yeah. So was it always an expectation that you'd go on to university after school? Pretty much. Um, my father, I think, would not have tolerated <laughs> me not going to university. By the time I got to the end of school, I absolutely wasn't ready to go and work, so I wanted to go to uni. So it wasn't a, it wasn't a big question. There was a slight flirtation I had in year 10 because I hated studying um, with leaving, but it was made clear that, that leaving in year 10 was certainly not an option, so... <laughs> um, yeah, I think by the time I was 18, then I could see that actually university had a lot going for it, not just about learning, but friends and culture and all the stuff, fun stuff about uni. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So when, when generally when you enter uni, like you, it's because it's, you know, it's the next natural step. You're not, not, not normally thinking about your future at the other end of the three or four years of your degree. <laughs> Certainly but, not when you do an arts degree. <laughs> no, I was thinking, but did you know at that point that you wanted to be a musician or that was going to be part of your career path or was this simply a way of extending your um, learning yeah, about music? <laughs> um, it was definitely a way of putting off having to make that decision going to uni as I kind of intonated. I was not ready to work um but it, it's funny you you bounce on that because it had been my go-to answer from quite a young child when someone said what do you want to be when you grow up to go I want to be famous like and of course smart adults would go oh what do you want to do to be famous oh, I don't know that was my young child answer I just wanted to be famous as I got older it, not only did I learn that that wasn't a really good answer, but again, music was a way to be famous. It was something I could do. So I think in my head going into uni, there was a hope that like somewhere down the line that would be the outcome. I mean, I was completely naive and <laughs> looking back at the 18-year-old I was, I, I was not a pop star. <laughs> but you know, that's part of the beauty of youth. You, <laughs> you don't see your limitations, I guess. But, um, yeah. So was there any thought about what comes after university? Not any concrete thought going in. I just wanted to do something that was fun and put off having to get a job. <laughs> Perhaps I'm still putting off having a job as long as I can. <laughs> so, well, you know, as long as you're having fun along the way. <laughs> so you finish your finish your uh, uni degree. Did you end up working with music at that stage? No. Um, so my degree, I did a major in songwriting and music production, and a major in playwriting and acting. Uh, and then I did a few other poetry writing and creative writing and stuff along the way. Uh, and by the end of my degree, I knew I didn't love acting enough to be an actor. I knew I loved songwriting and I probably wasn't a good enough performer at that point to have done much. Uh, we had to perform as part of the degree, but outside of, as I said, the, the church kind of music performances, I really hadn't done anything and different life stuff was happening for me at the end of university and 
I worked for about a year and then took off overseas, um, you know, sorting out my baggage and stuff that needed to be sorted through. And so I think there was a couple of years, maybe five or six there, of just coping with dealing with stuff, having therapy and going overseas a lot, <laughs> running away really and dealing with stuff. Uh, and I didn't really, I was writing always poetry and songs and stuff. And then it wasn't till I was at least mid, maybe late twenties. Uh, I'd done some other writing with pe- other people who were performing, but I had uh, uh, some friends, a married couple who had a little studio in their house and they were like, Naomi, we are going to make you make an album because you're never going to do it and you need to. So that was the start of me actually doing anything tangible as a musician. So that's a sorry story of wasted youth maybe, but, uh, yeah, that's wow. the way that so rolled your, out. Your friends are the ones who pushed you into it. 100%. Wow. Um, and I will be eternally grateful for that pragmatic frankness that said, right, we're going to make you do it. And yeah. they, were, they were great producers. They said, we want to make an album with 10 or 11 songs, write us 50, and we'll work from there. 50. <laughs> yeah. So I did have a, because I, I said I kept writing songs and would, you know, sit in my, live, my bedroom and play or whatever, but uh, just not do anything with them. So we then, I picked the 50 I wanted to kind of work with and we whittled it down. We recorded 14, I think, and 11 were on the album. Wow. How did that make you feel? Because obviously you hadn't been pursuing music at that stage. Your friends had seen this, you know, <laughs> talent and passion within you that you weren't pursuing. How did that make you feel when they were like, you have to do this now? That's a really good question. How do I feel about that? I think uh, there was fear. Like, could I? Was I good enough? Uh, yeah, I, I find it uh, really hard to remember because I've there's so much years since then of analyzing <laughs> who I was in my 20s. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a really tough one to answer. I don't remember, <laughs> but I did it. I, I know I didn't put up any resistance, I think yeah. they knew I wanted to. I probably talked about doing it for years and just didn't really know how to take that step, which is, mm. I think, a really common problem for young musicians because recording is expensive. Mm. And for all the lovely talk when you go to music conferences about how, you know, well, now it's about how social media can launch your career. Back then it was, you know, you can have the whole music studio on a computer now and everyone can have one in their house. Technically true, even if you have the money for that, doesn't mean you can use it well and record well. That's a whole whole different skill set. It's a skill set I hate and really just never want to have to learn how to use, you know, Logic or Pro Tool. I just hate them. Um, But if you're not going to learn to do it yourself, you have to pay someone to do it. And if you don't have a lot of money, like albums can be expensive. And my friends were doing it for free because we're friends, which is I think how many, many first albums get made. It's friends with benefits all the way. And, in fact, how my second album got made Um, because you have to save up a lot of money. And if you're really wanting to make something that's in terms of its uh, production quality comparable to what you hear, uh, you know, well-funded artists producing, I mean it's, 10 to 20 grand for an album if you really want to do it properly. Like, and that's a huge amount of money in your 20s to go, it's not going towards a car or a house or a, <laughs> anything else you're doing uh, or travelling as was my thing. Anyway, uh, I, uh, I am sure that I was scared and I'm sure that I put up no resistance. Uh, <laughs> So you must have known deep down there was the right thing to do. But I understand, like, yeah, investing, if you were to invest that money, it it would feel really, really risky when, you know, generally in those younger years, that's when you have the least amount of money. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And 
it is risky. I mean, it's risky if you hope to earn it back from what you make. You mm. probably won't. Like, and it sounds really horrible, but you make your money from performing, not especially now, not from your recordings. It really is a marketing tool to get people to gigs. So I don't know anyone who makes albums with an expectation that they will recoup the money they put on it from that album. I mean, if you're Taylor Swift, you will quite nicely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but for artists starting out, no. Yeah. So it's interesting you mentioned, yeah, that, that to make money as a musician it's about performing. Mm. I know that around COVID that was such a tumultuous time for so many performing artists because all of a sudden the gigs at, that they were doing were taken away and for, you know, sometimes multiple years not able to do that. How how has What was your impression of COVID and, and the impact on the music? industry it's no question that it put a real dent in people's ability to earn money now I personally yeah you know it made a difference but i wasn't depending on my music for money so i wasn't impacted my partner at the time uh is a music publisher and I was working with him on his website, which features the artists signed on his roster. And as I was going through building a page for each artist, this was kind of late 2020, early 21, so mi- right in the heart of lockdowns and stuff here, um, it was fascinating to see. These are all artists with publishers, backings, record company, you know, not massive artists, but um people making a living it's not a great living necessarily (laughs) they're not taylor swifting but they are uh making some living and mostly from touring what are they doing now and i'm looking at their websites because i had to get the links to their web and their socials to put on this central page and some were out there doing yeah this is our friday night gig every friday where we've turned what we can't do into something Mm -hmm. and they were pushing all these, you know, writing songs, you know, this week we did, we took a challenge from Abby. She said, write a song about blah. And they're silly songs, but they're doing something. And some had just fallen radio silent. Mm. So I think motivated, smart artists found ways to keep creating, to keep connecting with their audience. Uh, Some managed to record, but I think it certainly was my experience. And you know, maybe you've interviewed people who've found the same. I think that 2020 first lockdown, I think the the emotional milieu of the world was not conducive to creativity. I think there was a massive, between the fear and the unknown and the craziness and so many artists I know were just, I can't, it's, it, that's not the mood I'm in. I know I'm in my house doing nothing, but I'm not able to be creative. I mean, who knows? Mm. That was my reading of, yeah. Yeah. Did that affect your creativity, do you think? Um, I loved a lot of our lockdown being an introvert. I loved working from home and I loved not having to leave the house. Um, So I think, yeah, I actually did pretty well. But creatively, um, I'd also... Not long before, maybe late 2019, I had been writing and performing with a musical partner who had decided for personal reasons he needed to stop doing that and get a day job, (laughs) Um, which was the right decision for his family. But it meant that what I was doing had disappeared and then, you know, hadn't picked anything up. So... I can't say that COVID stopped because it had stopped already, but it kind of gave a neat excuse for me not to do anything. And to to kind of circle this long-winded story of my life back to now, I think I then did nothing um, under a nice veil of, well, there's nothing happening out there. I'm not doing anything in 2020, 2021, even into 22 a bit. Um, and then... By late 2022 and last year, 
the growing feeling of missing being on a stage, missing working with other people on writing songs and singing just, you know, in rehearsals is just fun. Really it's a growing hunger to to get back in it. Wow. Where so where did that come from? Do you think it's just from a just not doing it for so long or like where what's what's the catalyst? Yeah, I I didn't know when the when James, who was my musical partner, when he stepped away from music, I know I knew I didn't really want to do it on my own. I had lost my interest in <laughs> what I do as a solo artist. And as I said, it was a nice excuse not to do anything because I couldn't go out and meet new musicians and in and da 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 da. But I didn't know if I'd ever want to do it again. And I'm at an age midlife I don't care on one hand if I do it again uh if I never got on a stage again there are many other things I can pursue and be happy so it was a real surprise just to feel that starting to germinate again and probably I needed to put it all to bed without pressure is something going to grow here you know I buried it all in the ground is it you know just go well can't do anything just let it go watch some tv and (laughs) you know it it was a yeah it's been a real delight to go oh you know I see you there desire to perform and desire to write I'm just going to let you grow without pushing and without even kind of digging around and seeing what you're all about I'm just going to let you grow for a while and build up the desire to see if it dies off or not yeah so okay so it felt different this time going back into it because you had no expectations of what you wanted to do with it Mm. yeah that's cool and so where did that lead you since then well once it got to a point where I thought yeah I'm gonna have to do something about this because it's not going away and it's not dying off and I, I yeah I I assume that other people kind of hit their late 40s and into their 50s and feel a bit the same. Like if you're going to do something, you have to have a good reason for it because it takes energy and money and time and you're getting old and you don't have as much of all of those things as you used to. And so I've circled into, okay, well, what is it? What is it that I really want to do as an artist, um, as a performer? and as a writer and that has been an interesting confusing journey that I've never really had to take before because it just came out really easy and arguably I didn't have great success before because I hadn't done the pre-thinking and being clear on who I was as an artist I was just doing whatever came Um, but that was what was enjoyable now for all those middle-aged reasons, I need to know why I'm doing it. And so I want to be clear on who I am as an artist and who I am as a writer and the the goal kind of product. <laughs> and it's, it's not an easy thing to figure out at this age. I, I really have found it. It's interesting, but it's also not easy. Mm. Mm. Last time we spoke, I think we were sort of talking about this topic and you said something that really stuck out to me and it was um, meaningful creativity takes internal work. (laughs) Is that what you're talking about now? Uh, The internal work I'm doing is one type of the internal work that it takes. So, yes, uh, I think the internal work it takes to 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 do meaningful creativity is is much broader than me figuring out what uh, who I am as an artist once i get clear on that let's say i wanted to be um i, I don't know i want to pick a very famous artist so everyone knows who i'm talking about but <laughs> this is so not what i want to be let's say i wanted to be madonna you know she she is 60 or whatever she is still making pop music I wanted to make 
really dancey, poppy stuff that clubs love and and whatever. Then, okay, now I know our style. Now I know an idea of what the gig would be like. Then I have to write the songs. And there's a whole different layer of uh, internal work there. And perhaps some people can come out and churn out pop songs that are a bit meaningless. But again, the writing is the creative part that I really enjoy. So I to make something meaningful, I also have to know what kinds of things I'm going to write about and what kinds of things I'm going to say about the things I want to write about. And that's the really, like, I think that's also really tricky, knowing what the package is, (laughs) the Madonna style artist, and then, okay, well, what am I going to say? I think the internal work of great songwriters and I'm sure it's the same with great artists of any kind is they're willing to explore their emotional landscape and that's always if it's not hard you haven't probably done it deeply enough to make a a piece of work that moves people and that creates an emotion in them if you if that's what you're aiming for and I think all good art really good art does that or at least is trying to you've got to do your own work you've got to be in your emotions and it it is in in the songwriters who I have seen over years coming to our meetings the ASC sadly don't run anymore but bringing their songs for critique people writing about some very deep meaningful topics but not willing to be vulnerable and in their own deep emotions in in writing superficial and I think the audience will pick up on the superficiality and it won't move your audience there's a Mm -hmm. certain level of vulnerability you need and that takes the internal work yeah what you're just saying there kind of gives me greater context what you're talking about before about you know you're going back into exploring your music again now but you want to know the why and what you're going to do with it um and what you're saying there is like it's got to be meaningful and purposeful <laughs> mm. when it comes to your songwriting. Uh, that just gives me greater context to all of that because some people wouldn't really care so much. They're like, oh, I just want to make something that sounds cool and, you know, I can just churn it out. As long as it sounds nice, I'm happy. It doesn't need to be this like very deep, meaningful song. Right, right. And as as kind of beginner songwriters, I would always say if what you're doing is to write songs that you like so you can sit in your living room and play them to yourself, go, have at it. Like don't don't worry about bringing your songs for critique. Don't worry about spending money getting them recorded. Like if you never care if anyone else hears them, that in one sense is the best way to be creative because you're just pleasing yourself and you can do it and it doesn't really cost you much. But as soon as you expect someone to listen or consume whatever you're making you have a relationship with the consuming person and I think you have to consider their experience Mm -hmm. so if you're just writing a song and you don't care how accessible it is and you don't care how you know boring it might be to anybody else then I think you are not you're not being kind to your audience you're not being uh, engaging and not engaging in the real relationship that someone on a stage but any kind of artist has with their audience. As soon as someone else is involved, I think you've got to lift your game because you expect someone else to sit there and listen to your song. (laughs) So what makes a song worth listening to for the audience? And that, Mm. you know, welcome to... (laughs) How to write a song, lesson one. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I mean, it seems like throughout everything that you're saying, there's the songwriting, then there's the performing, and you've always resonated more with the songwriting part of things. How did you get involved with the Australian Songwriting Conference? Is that because of that passion or, like, how did that come about? Well, actually, I was first involved in the Sydney chapter of the Nashville Songwriters Association. Mm. Um so 
there is a, a songwriting teacher out of the US called Pat Patterson who is um, one of the most brilliant lyric writing teachers in the universe uh, and I have learned so much and grown so much from the many, many days of <laughs> weekend workshops I've spent in his classes. Uh, he teaches at the Berkeley School of Music but he married an Australian and they, pre-COVID at least, came out here at least once if not twice a year and ran workshops. It was at one of his workshops that I met um, the couple who had started the Nashville Songwriters Association in Sydney and from there started going to that group and was a member of the group. I helped run that group, in fact, for a while. Um, but times change and things change and at some point um, there wasn't the energy within the Nashville group to keep running but Lisa Butler who started the Australian Songwriting Conference which was a conference that happened once every two years uh, was looking to start some kind of monthly group and there were people in our group who were also very connected with Lisa and that negotiation started for our group to come under her banner and to be the first of her monthly uh, groups. So that happened, I don't know, 2016 or 17 or somewhere around there. So the Nashville group had been 10 or 12 years before that. So that's a <laughs> more information than you wanted. Um, but what that meant for us as a, a group, not only is we had bigger auspices um, and then we, uh, Lisa started a group in Melbourne and there may have been a third one, but when COVID hit, um, what we could then do is have one online group with people from all over the country, whereas it was in person in a pub before we would meet and do what we did. And that had its own beauty about it to suddenly have people from all over the country being able to be there and critique songs and hear speakers and stuff. So I think it was a good move for us. But again, those monthly meetings have stopped at the end of last year, maybe sometime last year. Because again, I think a good idea is a good idea until it's not a good idea anymore. And if there's no energy to run it, because these things take a lot of administrative time, I think we're also now 20 years older than when we started the group. And I think, yeah, the landscape is ripe for something else and it isn't that. So, yes. And then the next evolution, well, that's what we're talking about, isn't it? Like, it is. Creativity is always changing. And that's what it is. Like, if you're not, if it's not changing, is it really creativity? Do you know what I mean? Right. And, and people think, well, the creativity is in the songwriting, but if we're going to live creative lives, we have to be creative in how we think about the structures, how we build those structures to always be going, is there a more creative way? Is there a more fit for now way of doing this rather than just holding on to the way it's always been done? It's a, it's a belief that there is always evolution of people, of culture, of technology and all of those things not in an it doesn't have to be an exhausting way i don't think but there is a, a flow it's a river and we can't hold to the same things all the time mm -hmm. so it's a it's a kind of deeper level of creativity to go okay we need to let those lie fallow and see what the next iteration is yes yeah yeah give yourself space to be able to go on to the next thing rather than just jumping straight into something else that it's not necessarily the right way of doing it. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, unless it is, and the right way is to jump in, do it, and iterate as you go. But it's, I think, the danger you have in all of your life is to go, this is it forever, this is the best way, and no other way will be considered. You're always going to go, it's only good and, until it's not good. And Mm. Yeah, don't be afraid of the change. Mm. So tell me, what is what is next for you and your music and your songwriting? Well, uh, I have found, and this is the fresh, <laughs> fresh stuff in the last month or two, I've been going back through the massive back catalogue of unrecorded songs and uh my my floor in my living room is covered in I put all my song notes in a plastic pocket for each song. There's about 
40 songs sitting there that I think are worth putting some work into. So I'm pulling together all the bits of recording I have of little scratch tracks as I've half written these songs over the last however many years. And it's been fascinating to go back and re-listen to some things that are very old, some things that are just a couple of years old, and to go, actually, I think I think there's some stuff here that is is worth uh, listening to. And, in fact, that ex-partner who's the music publisher was listening to some of them. I said, what do you think of this song? What do you think of this song? And he's like, you've made two albums and left the best songs off both of them. <laughs> what the hell are you doing? <laughs> so that was a good way of uh, going, okay, there's some stuff here to work at. And, you know, I, I'm still struggling to figure out who I am as a 50-year-old woman wanting to be a performer and what is credible and meaningful at that age to say. And some of these songs are written from well before now. But to actually say it, to see that I wasn't as fickle as I might have thought that there is things, themes and ways of saying things that I can pull out of that. It's really been quite life-affirming that, uh, yeah, nice to know that actually my 50-year-old self looks at my 30-year-old self and sees, <laughs> actually, you had some depth and credibility then. You weren't just faffing around. Um, we can work with that. Uh, so I'm still looking for the sound that I'm after and the kind of sonic landscape that I might like to create. And who knows, who knows if I will decide that that 10 or 15 grand of recording will be worth it mm. or it'll just be finding a stage. I am looking forward to the point where I feel like I have new material that is good enough and warrants getting on a stage. Wow. Okay. So a few options for you. Watch this space, right? Watch this space. We'll see. <laughs> but don't watch it <laughs> expecting something this year. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much, Naomi, for um, sharing with me your journey. It's, you know, it's obviously got multiple different stages to your creativity and it's it's been wonderful to hear how your relationship with your music has changed over time, but you still can't put it aside yet. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it creeps, it creeps in despite all the other ways that creativity might be oozing out the sides of, you know, all the things that I do. But, yeah, there, there's this core part of me that loves the intersection of performing and the kind of poetry of songwriting and the emotion of the music. Mm. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, thank you so much. And um, also thank you to everyone who's tuned into Creativity Uncovered today. Um, if you enjoyed this episode, please do share it with a friend or um, spend a few moments to give us a rating or a review just to help spread the word a little bit. Um, and I really hope that this episode has inspired you to indulge your creativity and explore your creativity. And until next time, take care. If you've made it this far, a huge thank you for your support and tuning into today's episode. Creativity Uncovered has been lovingly recorded on the land of the Cubby Cubby people, and we pay our respect to elders past, present, and emerging. This podcast has been produced by my amazing team here at Crisp Communications, and the music you just heard was composed by James Gatling. If you liked this episode, please do share it around and help us on our mission to unlock more creativity in this world. You can also hit subscribe so you don't miss out on any new episode releases.